Malcolm Miles is Professor of Cultural Theory at the University of Plymouth. His main research interest is in the development of critical theories of culture and society since the mid-20th century in relation to contemporary art and urban change. Malcolm Miles is the author of Urban Avant-Garde from 2004, Cities and Cultures from 2007, <coughs> and most recently, Urban <coughs> Utopias, the built and social architectures of alternative settlements from 2008. Currently, he's working on a book on Herbert Marcuse's aesthetic theories from the 1930s to the 1970s, uh, which will be published in 2011, that's this year. And uh, I think we're going to have sort of an appetizer <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on this uh, under the title Society as a Work of Art. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the, the, the manuscript was delivered about two weeks ago, so um, it should be out in October, November, I think, probably this year, if, it, if they think it's okay. We'll see. Um, I have a, a script, but I'm also going to deviate a little bit from it. Um, First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's delightful to be here in Copenhagen and especially in Aachen, which I came to once before on a very sunny day and had a nice walk along the beach and sitting in the dunes and so on. But it's, it's an interesting environment in, in its own way. And dutifully, I walked through the fog tunnel today, right to the end, but I, kept, I cheated because I kept where I could feel the wall. <laughs> I'm old and tired and so on. <laughs> um, this will very slightly pick up on some of the things said by Stephen in the first talk this morning, uh, only obliquely, because obviously I didn't know what you were going to say, but that's an interesting <laughs> framing, and I think it's possibly a conversation that doesn't take place because we sort of slightly miss each other in the night, but around that sense of criticism doesn't count anymore. I'm probably underneath a deeply pessimistic person, so I just say, yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> But I might be so deeply pessimistic that it actually is quite frightening for me. So I cling on to hope. So I have to be sort of optimist <laughs> on the surface at least. Or maybe really, I've never known quite which way round they were. I'm a citizen of the EU, like many of us. Um, but I live in a part of the EU that now has a non-elected government following the institutionally legitimate coup of May 90, uh, sorry, not 90, <laughs> 2009. I almost said 1997 there for some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, and I think quite interesting changes are actually beginning to happen in, in this very new situation following the financial services industry's crash and the total impoverishment of everything else to pay for that. And already the cracks are beginning to appear. Um, part of me then gets quite nostalgic because I think, oh, well, yeah, it'll be like the 60s again, great. And it won't because history doesn't repeat itself, that's quite clear. But something else may happen that we can't predict, and that will be an interesting thing to see. It may yet fail again, of course, but at some point, I suppose things gradually get inflected modestly in a slightly new direction. Maybe that's where hope resides now, in a very contingent, negotiated, actually rather postmodern kind of way. I was, um, I suppose you could say, figuratively, a child of the Attlee government of the post-war period, which built the welfare state in the term of one period of government, which is quite an extraordinary achievement. Um, and that is what is now being demolished, of course, which will probably also happen in the period of one government, although it actually began in the 1980s under Thatcher and was advanced considerably under Blair. I just wanted, before I get on to the talk, there was one thing I particularly wanted to mention, though, because I think we're now in a new phase in relation to hope and critique. And th this is where I, I pick up. And it comes up particularly in the issues around urban regeneration, or urban redevelopment might be perhaps a more accurate way to, to describe that, because it's often largely about property. But it's through the 80s, through the 90s, particularly through the 90s under New Labour in what was called Cool Britannia, urban redevelopment was presented as a very good thing. And culture was deeply complicit or implicit in the project. So not only hundreds of bits of useless public art all over the place, but actually developers tried to present themselves as Renaissance princes with sculpture collections and gardens and so on. 
And there was a very clear effort to mask what was usually very socially divisive redevelopment with the Renaissance values, which are taken to be universal, of culture. And that took a whole set of forms. And artists were able to either just work in it or work against it or negotiate with it and find a critical position in relation to it. So a very wide spectrum of responses to that situation, as one would expect, of course, very plural. But I think what's happened now is all that culture stuff has been identified as too new labor and has been dropped. So the money for the arts has been slashed by 30%. That's OK, that's happening now. But actually, the rhetoric has changed as well. And we are now seeing what were absolutely utopian social housing projects from the post-war period, often in the brutalist architectural style, because that was the style of international modernism, which was a utopian movement at the time, recoded as problem estates, particularly when they're not, but they're in a good postcode, i.e. the land is valuable. So there's a subtle recoding of, well, you know, we can't maintain the buildings. That's nonsense. Um, well, the people are all kind of criminals or whatever, drug addicts. That's also largely nonsense. Um, so that regeneration as an industry targets these utopian estates for total redevelopment, peripheralizing the poor, which is what always happened through the 19th century and it's happening again now, to create the gentrified city for the young professionals in the financial services industry, which is now going as strong as ever, regardless of whatever happened before. So it may be that in that situation, hope is actually completely redundant. Maybe we are in a process of mourning now, and soon it will be just historical archive material to think about anything as positive as intervention, uh, cultural intervention particularly, in those things. Or not. And I really don't know what will happen next. So we'll find out. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, quite briefly, I'll try not to go on too long because I know it's the last one and you're all tired and probably cursing the fact that there is yet another talk you have to sit through. And I hope there'll be some discussion afterwards as well. But I want to set a little bit of a context. Um, I'm going to, in the middle of this, I'm going to talk about Herbert Marcuse's concept of society as a work of art and try and explain a little bit about what I think he meant by that. But to do that, I need to go, I need to do a kind of backstory to say a little bit about the times in which he produced that idea. And I should also mention, I suppose, that Marcuse's writing from the 30s through to the late 70s, he died in 1979, does go through at least three major phases and possibly four. There's a kind of subtext which I'm going to mention a little bit, and um, perhaps particularly at the end, which is another story altogether, indeed, and, and which I find particularly interesting one, in fact. Or maybe what I find interesting is the tension between the stories. Yes, he says this. Yes, he says that. What's, what's the problem there? They don't agree. No, but there's a creative tension between them. That's where our work can take place. So in the 1930s, with the rise of fascism, which totally haunts critical theory, um, of course, art is part of bourgeois culture, affirmative culture, enables society to do all, all the sanding over of, of difference to erase uh, any uh, resistance, which is actually, I think, a lot of what happened in the 1990s too, in fact. In the 1960s, it's quite different. Having been a fairly obscure philosophy professor in the United States, having written a couple of books, Eros and Civilization, which is Marx and Freud, and One Dimensional Man, which is a critique of the, the total domination of society or the affluent consumer society by its apparatus. Um, neither of those actually sold that many copies when they first came out, but both were republished as paperbacks in popular editions in 1966. And this coincides with the student movement. Uh, it's a very complex, layered history. Um, I can only sketch it in very brief terms. So there's a lot of compression and a lot I necessarily leave out here. But the new left is, is not one monolithic thing. Uh, there's the counterculture, so there's San Francisco, the hippies, the summer of love in 67. But even that term, summer of love, is partly derived from previous events back through the civil rights movement in the early 60s. Uh, 64 in Mississippi, I think, was a particularly crucial time. A lot of 
relatively well-off white northern US students went down to the south in the civil rights movement and learned techniques of non-direct, uh, sorry, non-violent direct action. This then informs aspects of the student movement. The student movement isn't exactly the same as the new left, which also includes some of the professors and intellectuals and writers and, and so on. So itself is quite complex and pluralist. That's there alongside the counterculture. And everyone agrees the war in Vietnam should stop. And obviously you know, the slogan, which I, I used to have a little badge that said, make love, not war. Um, and that was very much, I think, a, a kind of shared mood, ambience of that time. I went to art school. Um, I started art school in London in 1967 at Chelsea, which was just off the King's Road, which is where we had our version of hippie culture and so on. And it was, I remember the, the first days I, I was an art student, having been released from school and suburban family life in outer West London and all sorts of horrendous adolescent things. Well, I wasn't, of course, really released. I was thought I might be, but anyway, it took longer than that. I <laughs> managed it yet, really. Um, but on the radio, almost every five minutes, there was that song, If You Go to San Francisco, Wear Some Flowers in Your Hair. And it was just so nice. It was lovely, you know. <laughs> and then in the studios in the art school, Nico and the Velvet Underground were echoing around all the time as well. It was just sort of a slightly darker side of that. But that was, that was also really good. Really good. I still have uh, some of that music on now on CDs, of course. All of this, you have to imagine, as an incredibly complex social phenomenon. And I think it's probably quite different on each side of the Atlantic. Yes, there are certain, obviously, commonalities around the war in Vietnam. Major demonstrations in the US, major demonstrations in London, other European cities, and so on. Um, you also have people on the move. You, you, you have you know, the, the hippie trail to India, which wasn't only hippies. It was lots of other people trailing along as well. You have the departure from cities to found intentional communities in rural areas where the land is cheap and you can get out of the glare of publicity and be left on your own to do the research and development work as to how you do consensus decision making and work out how you deal, deal with seriously mentally problematic issues and, and, and so on. Um, and some of those communities are, are still there. But I think there was probably a cultural difference between, say, the US and Paris in 68. 67, the summer of love, hope, loveliness, it's fine. Um, uh, also, lots of, um, how should we put it, the medicine cabinet was restocked with slightly different kind of mind-changing substances. Um, and I'm sure that was an enormously important factor there, too. Um, it actually figures to an extent in what Marcuse says, though he stuck to cigars, and he, he didn't smoke marijuana, he's just um, stays quite conventional as, as, as an individual. But that notion that there could be a new consciousness is certainly quite central to the moment of 67, 68. But maybe they're actually two slightly different moments. Paris in 68 begins in the campus at Nanterre, which is a new university out on the edge of town where Henri Lefebvre taught in, in sociology, among others. Um, Lefebvre already had a long relationship with the Situationist group. So there's at least 10 years of, of radical art making. There's the Lettrist, there's, there's Fluxus, and so the whole set of radical, performative, interventionist movements, groups going on. The, the numbers involved are relatively small, but they're very tightly knit, and they're quite, um, in a sense, widely publicized among informal networks, I suppose. Probably rather romanticized now. I mean, the, the derive, the drift, partly really was just a group of young lads with a few bottles of wine going around Paris in a taxi finding interesting places. And actually, it was more than that, too. But it's funny how, you know, when revolution happens, it's, it, nobody quite realizes, it, oh, this is revolution, do it properly, you know. I mean, because um, they might document this. Um, <laughs> was actually quite informal. Um, and... and it sort of makes sense more after the event perhaps than, than at the time. But what was particularly important politically was the occupations. The students occupying the campuses, the workers occupying the factories. There are tensions between the two. There are tensions between the workers occupying the factories and the French Communist Party because it wasn't in charge of events. And the French Communist Party has always been a rather, in a sense, a conservative communist party in Europe. I think if you look at Greece, Italy, Portugal, you have a rather different kind of picture, a much more open-ended kind of communism. Um, 
and, and that's still the case in certainly in countries like Portugal. Um, but in France, the, there was a, a more Stalinist Communist Party. But this technique of occupation had first been used in the 1930s. It was politically loaded from the start. It was part of an anti-fascist struggle, in other words, from the days of the Popular Front, 32, 33, 34. And I think that that's something that would be easy to overlook from a historical distance or from another country. Um, philosophers spoke on in the street. Um, Sartre, which isn't him there, that's, I, that's someone else, but uh, imagine a massive public intervention of intellectuals at street level. The occupations weren't just to take over, they were actually to carry on educating. So lots of lectures, seminars, all that goes on, probably rather more intensively than it did under the old system, in fact, which was fairly relaxed in lots of ways. And 67 and 68 also setting up what were called free universities. So I remember in the summer of 68 in Bristol in the southwest of England, work, working as a volunteer in a free school for children set up by Bristol Free University. And these were all informal institutions, at least initially. Um, some were particularly strong, as in Berlin, where Marcuse gave some lectures in 67 for the Free University. And interestingly, um, it's coming back. About three months ago, somebody set up the Free University of Liverpool as a new institution in face of education cuts and st our issue of student fees and, and so on. So again, that, that's interesting. History doesn't repeat. The situation is very different. But sometimes the motif is useful as a kind of catalyst. I wouldn't put it more strongly than that. There was also a personalization of politics, and I think that's enormously important. I just want to read a short quote from Julia Kristeva, published in 2002 in an interview when she's looking back on Paris in 1968, in which she was a participant. She's in the middle of the photograph there. The liberation of social behavior was an essential experience of 68. Group sex, hashish, etc., were experienced as a revolt against bourgeois morality and family values. All of us from my generation went through it. This movement can only be described as political because it began by striking savagely at the heart of the traditional conception of love. It's this liberated behavior that contributed to the liberation of French society, still straitjacketed in old 19th century ways, terrified by the Algerian war. We shouldn't forget that 68 was a worldwide movement that contributed to an unprecedented reordering of private life. I find that very interesting. Um, the slogan, the political is personal, the person is political, is, is kind of commonly used now. It's become just ordinary. But I think this was really quite an important new thing at that time. It opens up a number of other issues, which I'm going to come on to at the end. But I mentioned just now because um, there is actually a literary tradition back to Baudelaire at least. Uh, this is a painting, an early painting by Matisse, about 1904, I think, um, called Lux Calme Volupte, a title borrowed from Baudelaire's poem Invitation to the Voyage. And it, it's a painting of a utopian scene, the life of ease, the life of bliss, the life of happiness, which of course is always the projected end of enlightenment, of rationality. It just didn't quite work out that way yet. But that tradition is there, and that literary tradition is fundamentally utopian and shares with other more explicitly political utopias, from Peter Kropotkin, for example, the idea there could be a society. What if we didn't have to work? Or if there was just a minimal amount of work and most of life wasn't work? But, well, what? That's a big question because leisure, and Lefebvre is very strong on this, has actually become just like work. Alienating work requires compensation through leisure, which you have to pay for because it's consumerism. It's either shopping or various kinds of other things that you have to pay for. Therefore, you have to work more to get more leisure. Boom. It's a vicious circle. And, and that's kind of how they, they get you. But how is the dream made real? There's a much longer tradition of millenarianism, way, way, way back to the Middle Ages. Um, the notion that suddenly a new society can be proclaimed. Abbot Joachim of Fiori, 
in Calabria, southern Italy, around the year 1200, with his followers, proclaimed the Third Kingdom. Not the Third Reich, though that borrows exactly that terminology, because the Nazis are thieves of every motif they use. The Third Kingdom is the Third Age, the New Age. <coughs> you could say the Age of Aquarius in rather 60s speak. Property and office were immediately abolished. They were living the life to come in the life now. And that seemed to be the point. Two things. First of all, it's immediate. It's the immanent, all-pervasive now, present revolution, not the imminent, soon to come, one day, if, well, not yet, but only ever in the distant future we can't imagine. No, actually only in art or in literature, and further and further away it goes. The immanent, not the imminent revolution. Sorry if that's a complicated playing with English language. And I, I'm conscious that I'm not in England, I'm in Denmark, and sorry I can't do this in, in Danish. Um, but that difference of the all-pervasive now and the one day we plan for the future does seem absolutely crucial. The millenarian tradition is that. The second thing it is, is it's a break in history. It's a rupture. It fractures history. It isn't just a program, like a trajectory. It's not a Hegelian thing from past to future to, uh, you know, kind of end that, the way that we're supposed to kind of drift with history anyway. It isn't about that. It's about actually smashing it, just cutting it in half. That's, that's it. And I think, in a way, a kind of softer version of that would be what happens in intentional communities. It's not a violent break of history. Uh, medieval millenarians, li like the Anabapsids in Munster, th there tended to be quite a lot of violence around that. But, but actually, much of the violence was the suppression of this, too. One shouldn't forget that. But the intentional communities that began in the 60s, the eco-villages that multiplied greatly in the 90s, and many of which, again, are still there and thriving, um, Many in this country, Denmark was actually very much at the forefront of setting up eco-villages. Um, interesting noise. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, it's nice. Uh, birds, probably. Um, <laughs> so, it's nice. Fra St. Francis talk gave his sermon to the birds. But I'm not St. Francis. I'm not as meek as that either. Um, I get paid. Um, so, sorry. The, p the point seems that as I said before, the research and development work for a new society based on things like sharing, commonality, consensus decision-making, it always seems central, is taking place as we sit here now in eco-villages around the world, in intentional communities. And it seems to me that that is living the revolution before the revolution, as we used to think of it, takes place. So no longer the crowns with red banners, the torch-lit processions, the storming of the Winter Palace. Actually, this isn't the storming of the Winter Palace. That, this is the 1920 reenactment, um, and they know that because the lighting is wrong. It can't be the, the... It was at a different time of day when it really happened. And actually, when you, have, when you were in the middle of that kind of revolution, did you actually get the cameras put in the right position? So, no, go, don't go yet. It isn't ready yet. <laughs> and photography in those days was not as easy as digital phones and stuff now, by the way, either. So this is the reenactment involving 10,000 actors, mainly from the Army and Navy in 1920. Anyway, it won't be like that again. I'm pretty sure of that. I'm often wrong, though. Um, but it may be in new social movements. And I won't go any further than in that, because that's another big story. Um, but I find it quite inspiring, quite hopeful, that there are so many alternative settlements, and that they appear to be growing, not shrinking and that they are working very hard on how to produce a new way of living. This is the House for Lovers in, in Zeg, um, a well-established eco-village in, in Ger Belzig in Germany, about an hour from Berlin by train. Do you can, uh, um, Zeg has free love, so you can book this for a night and you go up the ladder and sway in the trees for a night of love. It's a very nice idea. I haven't tried, obviously, but um, it's there. They also do a huge amount of work around nonviolent conflict resolution. And again, you know, it's research and development work for a new society. And it's very hard work. The, the other stuff, where we get told what to do all the time, that's been going on for tens of thousands of years. This has a lot to learn. We shouldn't expect it to be perfect and have answers for us all now. And I just will put in one anecdote that while I spent a few days there, um, trying to find out how it functioned. Somebody said, 
actually had a very difficult meeting recently. Very, it was very, very long, conflictual. It was very difficult indeed. I, s I naively I said, oh, what, what was it about? Uh, well, well, it was to change the time of the evening meal by 30 minutes. I thought, well, yeah, okay, it's like war in Iraq, um, <laughs> Afghanistan, and poverty everywhere, and global warming. And actually, you don't all sit down to eat together. It's just the food's put out at a time. You come in and out and help yourselves. And then I realized, no, it doesn't matter what the meeting was about. It's where all the shit comes out. It's like we say, I don't like you very much, but we both have to go on living here. How do we deal with that? And it seemed to me that was the social glue. And to make that open, um, they use a technique called forum, which I won't go into, but specific, again, conflict resolution, nonviolent technique. And it takes a very long time. And one should not expect otherwise. So, right, now if we get to the meat in the sandwich, um, well, don't eat meat very often, actually. Fish in the sandwich. Um, Herbert Marcuse in 1967. Marcuse was possibly as well or even better known in Europe then than he was in the US, I think, because he spoke so much over here. Um, he was obviously well known in San Diego, where he was working, and he certainly went to lots of other campus demonstrations across the US, was involved in the protests against Vietnam, but also actually reorganizing education, a, li a liberation of how teaching took place, which was very conservative indeed in, in the 1960s. I think the has got a bit better, it still has, in my view, a long way to go. We still don't really hand over to students how to write the curriculum, for example, but obviously we should. But he came to Berlin in July of 1967, age 69. His birthday was uh, while he was away, I think. Um, so already beyond retirement age in, in British terms, um, which is normally 65, but that law is being changed because he won't be allowed to retire. because. If we don't retire, we can't get a pension. It saves the government a lot of money. So he came in 67. He spoke at the Free University, gave a series of lectures, including one called The End of Utopia, which was about the end of the dream of utopia and the beginning of the reality. And he came to the Roundhouse in London, an old railway shed that was converted into a big concert and meeting hall place, um, where there was a two-week event called the Dialectics of Liberation Congress. I didn't go to that because I didn't actually know about it. I was 17, just starting art school in the September that year. I, I just wish I'd known. I wish I'd been two years older because I could have understood what they were saying then too. But I was just in my sort of gap between different things. However, the hippies were there, the flower children with the flowers in their hair and so on in force, and lots of intellectuals and lots of other people. It was obviously a real intensive moment, the hothouse. He began noticing the flower children saying, I'm very happy to see so many flowers here. And that is why I want to remind you that flowers by themselves have no power whatsoever, other than the power of men and women who protect them and take care of them against aggression and destruction. He gave a talk following the black power activist Stokely Carmichael. And that was a very different kind of talk. That was very focused on black power, obviously, and uh, the struggle. Marcuse's was more meditative, more philosophical, um, possibly more difficult for people to understand in some ways, although it's, uh, it's not philosophically difficult, it's, it's fairly accessible. But the basic argument that he tried to set out was that the kind of revolution that could take place in this moment of 67, which became 68, where it eventually failed, was unlike any other before. Because, for example, it was in an affluent society. <coughs> it wasn't the old model of the workers driven down in poverty, therefore have nothing left to lose, therefore take to the streets. Clearly, in a consumer society, people have huge amounts to lose. They're enormously invested in the society of which they're members. And yet, there were signs of that falling apart, si huge signs of disillusionment in the new social movements of the time. And I think he was very inspired by those. But also, and this is where he picks up on a much older idea, technological advance appeared to have reached the point where, in effect, much work could be abolished. So rather than arguing for 
work which was less alienating through an improvement marginally in conditions of work, you could argue for just a reduction in work. Ten years later, Andre Gortz makes a very similar case in his book, Farewell to the Working Class. Now, one of the byproducts of this argument, of course, is that the class-based argument for revolution has to be radically revised. Marcuse remains a Marxist throughout his life. There's no doubt about that. He reaffirms this in interviews right into the late 70s. Um, he remains committed to an open model of socialism, which could be really existing, though he also recognised, obviously, that the problem with really existing socialism in the East Bloc was it didn't really exist in the way intended. Part of it did, but a lot of it didn't, and there were obviously abuses. He had actually already written a book on Soviet Marxism, so his, his critique on the East Bloc is, is published long before this, um, well, several years before this. So the possibility seems to be utopian in the sense that through a technological advance in an affluent society, there could actually be a life of ease. Freedom, leisure for all social classes. And with that, the development of a new sensibility that would be the new society. So it's almost like the new society is, is a state of psyche as much as a material reality. He says, if today, oh, sorry, there's one other point. He thinks that cha radical change may suddenly happen because the contradictions in the existing society are so excessive that they provoke it. And it's, later he talks about what he calls new biological needs, which I've, I've never been quite sure about the, the biological aspect of this, but um, we'll see. So basically what he says is that in a situation where you have the possibility, and this is evident, but it is constantly denied to you every day through the apparatus of the dominant, the existing society, this in itself breeds a consciousness which is resistant. And actually that's not too far away from things that Foucault or Lefebvre would have said in very different terms and in very different contexts and different languages, but... Um, there seems to be that basic model that the situation itself produces its own breakdown. If today, he says, these integral features, these truly radical features which make a socialist society a definite negation of the existing societies, if this qualitative difference today appears as utopian, this is precisely the form in which these radical features must appear if they are really to be a definite negation of the established society. That's slightly wordy. Um, the key word there is qualitative. So he differentiates between the quantitative advances of consumerism, which are continuous, the endlessly expanding market innovation, but also built in obsolescence and so on, and qualitative difference, which means a different state of mind. Well, the flower children were there. We've been through that. That life of ease, of course, also has its own history in art too. Sierra's painting The Bathers, which is one of a pair with the, the Grand Jacques, which is in Chicago, um, and they are on opposite banks of, of the River Seine. They are closely connected images, is the image of the new society. Sierra was uh, connected to anarchist circles in Paris in the 1880s. Um, he doesn't, there isn't documentary evidence of this as a programmed painting. So art historians have argued as to, no, it isn't really an anarchist picture at all, and some have said, yes, it is. Um, I'm not going to get into that controversy now. But it does seem to make sense. If you look at, if you just ask, why did he put these things in the picture? On this side, the artisans. On the other side, in the Grand Jacques, the bourgeoisie enjoying permanent leisure. Enabled by the factories of cliché industry in the background, which are not there as a compositional device. They're not there simply because they are there. They're there because they've been put there. And that seems to me to clinch that interpretation of the picture. Now, what comes out of this, which leads into the notion of society as a work of art? And I think it is quite an established idea that becomes revived at this point in 67, the ludic libidinal society. One of the precedents for this would be the writing of Charles Fourier, um, a French utopian thinker from the 
mm, early 19th century. His, his formative experiences were actually during the French Revolution, but his writing is in the 19th century, um, where he envisages a society which not only has leisure, is completely reorganized to live in new uh, collective entities instead of cities, spread evenly throughout the country, um, and in which uh, people's, uh, it's kind of complicated to go into, but people are analyzed in terms of their character types, and then they are selected to be put in, it's like heavily maneuvered, put into these phalanstères, the new communities, so that work becomes pleasurable association. Personality types are matched with tasks. Uh, it's very tabulated and complicated and, and completely inoperable because of that, I suspect. It also assumes that personality types don't change, which is kind of problematic too. But as an ideal, it's a not an interesting one. He also proposed a sexual minimum, a bit like the minimum wage. You get a certain amount of sex in your life, like whatever. Um, and you, but there could be more, but anyway, that's guaranteed. Um, and he does write some really very embarrassing, erotic material about life in the Falanstair, <laughs> which is uh, kind of, he lived alone in rented attic rooms and um, it's like, all, you know, awful, it's complete fantasy. However, leaving that aside, there are several strands that feed into this idea of the life of ease. It's sort of like, the, you know, the, the land of cocaine from way back in, in um, Bruegel's paintings, for example, it, it's, it's there if you, if you look for it. A society in which work is play, in which association is eroticized. And Marcuse is quite clear, he doesn't mean life becomes an orgy. He, he means eros in the Freudian sense, the life instinct. And that in place of the death instinct, which he maintains is still very much part of, of psychoanalysis, and then at that point he says, now I throw in the terrible concept. It would mean an aesthetic reality. Oh, sorry, a slight typo there. A society as a work of art. This is the most utopian, the most radical possibility of liberation today. And I, I wonder what we do with that. He throws <laughs> in this idea, and it's near the end of the talk. And it's kind of just left floating, in a sense. He picks it up again, though, in a talk in Salzburg uh, in August of 1967, where he starts to talk about beauty as non-repressive ordering. That's kind of an interesting idea, beauty itself. But that, of course, is, is also quite closely connected with modernism in art, the notion of autonomy, that for artistic form has its own laws. Because these are other than those of the social regime, they are potentially a, an alternative to that regime. Later on, when he writes the aesthetic dimension in the 70s, that becomes the key story. That autonomy, which distances art from society, is also its critical distance. Its criticality is what it has left in the darker years that follow the failure of revolution in 68. There's a whole lot I don't have time to go into there. But I wanted just very briefly, um, and I have what, five minutes? Yeah. yeah. Just to throw around this idea, well, okay, what, what can we do with that idea? Looking back over 30 years or 40 years, what would it mean? Would it mean direct democracy? Is, is that what he's on about? Boyce in Castle in 1972 at the Documenta 5 set up the Office for Direct Democracy for 100 days in the art gallery space. People could come and ask him questions. He would give his views on things. There would be all sorts of performative interventions taking place. Boyce was also a founder member of the German Green Party, so he was a very politicized person. And yet, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. Um, some people have written about Boyce as, and, and he himself writes about himself, as a kind of shaman figure. And I can see, yeah, okay, so Enlightenment rationalism got screwed up. What else? <laughs> but I have serious reservations about appropriating other people's cultures without knowing anything at all about them. Shamanism doesn't exist in modern European industrial society. It exists elsewhere. It still exists in some places, but not here. Can you just take on that? Is that meaningful? What it might do, 
is simply reconfirm the notion of the avant-garde artist. And that's deeply problematic because although it's idealistic and hopeful in many ways, if I, as the avant-garde artist or writer, foresee the future, I see the golden dawn, the bright new world, the new society to come, and I'll tell you about it. I'll lead you towards it. I am interpreting the world for you, which means I'm telling you you can't interpret it for yourselves, which means you're completely disempowered and disenfranchised, and I have the privilege. And actually, that's why it doesn't work. That's a contradiction. That's a deep flaw. Now, this isn't a kind of personal critique of Boyce, who I never met and, and so on, but I think it's a serious problem, critically, in relation to some of that kind of work. But Boyce is complex. There are lots of layers of, of what he does. And different people have written about him in very different ways, too. And, of course, it's always problematic looking back now quite some time, because we're, we're, we're looking at the representation of the representation, of, as usual. And certain things get lost. We tend, almost without know it, knowing it, to recode whatever we talk about. If it wasn't that, coming much more up to date, would it be art activism? Um, for example, the group Park Fiction in Hamburg, a few years ago in the St. Pauli district, which is scripted for gentrification. Uh, the gentrification has stalled a bit because of the recession, but it's still meant to be the next kind of young professionals high rent zone, overlooking the river, so in a good position. Park fiction, working with um, uh, lots of squatted houses, by the way. Big, big apartment houses, squatters taking over. So you have a kind of young squatting population, a bit like Amsterdam in the 60s. You have various other people who are long-term residents, recent moved into the area and so on. Working with all of those people on a key public space overlooking the waterfront, which you see them here, to make a public park designed by citizens. Um, which actually happened. It's there. You can go. I Last year, on my way to Copenhagen, I took the train from Hamburg so I could have a couple of days there. I went in the evening, went in the morning, see different times. It was thronging with life. It seemed very successful public space. Um, you can find out huge amounts about park fiction on the web, so I won't go into this anymore now. Maybe that would be one possibility. Would that be society as a work of art? Well, it certainly would be public space as a work of art. Whether it will, in the end, stop gentrification is another issue. And does it deal with all sorts of other things? I don't know. They do have they have a sort of slightly fantasy degentrification kit they're promoting, which includes things like cellophane you can put over windows with lots of cracks on it, um, small planks you can put on things to like patch up buildings with, um, and the key one, the little shopping bag. Little is the cheapest supermarket, so you put it at lots of things and carry that around with you all day to show this is a, a low class poor pe person's area. So you wouldn't want to move in here. And even better. You hang it outside your kitchen window full of stuff to show your fridge has broken down. Um, <laughs> so I think that's kind of quite nice. I don't know. The third example, which I think brings it much more back into the art gallery, Free Art Collective, three artists, Andy Hewitt, Mel Jordan, and Dave Beach, um, based mainly in Sheffield in the north of England, though Dave Beach teaches in, in London, um, whose work is performative, and sometimes in the street, but very kind of posed and known usually through photographs of them performing the piece. And this is specifically a gallery piece. Um, they, they tend to work on billboard scales, so the photographs are reproduced as billboard pieces for a gallery, and in some cases billboards out in the street as well, maybe both at the same time, including this one, Protest is Beautiful, with um, a bit like a kind of set of wreaths made in letter shapes using plastic yellow flowers. And there's a kind of irony there, maybe. It's certainly artificial, and yet there's a kind of, maybe a kind of nostalgia too, although they're younger than me, so they wouldn't remember the 60s as their formative times. Um, and yet there's still a statement, protest is beautiful. And it comes in two forms. Ah, another typo, sorry about that. I put, put this text in a bit of a hurry, obviously. Um, but I want to put it the other way around, because thinking back to Marcuse's Society as a Work of Art paper in Salzburg in August 67, where he argues that beauty itself is a protest. Maybe it's not protest is beautiful, but beauty is protest. And going back to Rimbaud, beauty is convulsive or not at all. Beauty is the shock. That's kind of a surrealist idea, 
but in some of his early works, not used, refers to surrealism. In the 1970s, it all gets much darker because 68 failed and we have to regroup and the, the new left gradually, I suppose, becomes another new new left or whatever and we have a succession of never quite getting to be another new left in the end, but maybe one day. The Aesthetic Dimension is a much darker book. But I just wanted to remind us that actually in 1945, when Marcuse was working for the United States government in the intelligence department, working on propaganda, in fact, and then later on the denazification program in Germany, till 51, he wrote a quite obscure essay on French literature in the German occupation, in which he says, basically, and I have to just completely compress it into about a sentence, freedom under those conditions, very specifically under those conditions, is located in a literature of love, not politics. Love stories, the poems of Paul Eloi, novels of Louis Aragon, both of whom, of course, were communists as well. And I found, and this was quite interesting, I will be very short now. Eloi's poem, Liberté, actually was dropped by parachute by Allied planes over occupied France in 1942 in specially printed miniature editions of a literary magazine. It actually was propaganda. It's, it's a love poem of which the last word is, it said, I have all stuff, I will name, I, I will name you, I'll name you, so, and the last word is, and your name is Liberté. It was actually passed by the German censor. <laughs> there was a backlog of stuff to be assessed. The censor didn't read the whole poem, he just read the beginning few verses. He said, oh, you poets always say the same thing all over again. It's a love poem, yeah, it's not print it doesn't matter. Um, it's apparently French children were required to learn it by heart after the war. I don't know if they still are. But that seems to me very interesting indeed. So we're back to Matisse there, the promise of happiness. And what Marcuse focuses on in this essay, published in, uh, sorry, not published when he wrote in 1945, not published till 1991, and is now in the collected papers edition, is what he calls the promesse du bonheur, the promise of happiness, the promise of bliss which is the most utopian idea. And maybe that is a society as a work of art. And maybe it isn't only activism. And maybe in times where we are brought very close indeed to despair, the image of bliss is what we have left. As to the rest, I don't know. Art can't change the world on its own, if at all. Do we need art? If society becomes a work of art, the specialist category of art becomes redundant. That's obvious. This is outside the Bauhaus, the recent exhibition. Is it art or can we throw it out? Ask the administration. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just have a, actually a very, very low practical remark um, which concerns the weather because what you hear is not birds, unfortunately. It's a really, really strong storm. And I was just informed that apparently um, there's some small stones sort of <laughs> flowing off the ground and, and some car windows have actually oh been, been smashed or somehow scratched it. So I just want to say it and just want to let you know then you can decide for yourself if you want to leave or if you want to stay on the arch. Arkham, it should be safe. <laughs> and apparently the storm won't get worse. This is like worse. a surrealist film, isn't it, where we'll never <laughs> leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay here for the whole day. I just want to let you know because... So we uh, better make... This must become the new society because otherwise <laughs> we're really stuck. <laughs> Unless you want to elect a president. And yeah. Yeah. You, you could be the head of art. <laughs> I'll just be the chair of the Politburo, <laughs> some old-fashioned Marxist. Okay, so now it's, it's, it's said, and I just wanted to let you know, because the guards obviously are, are, are quite concerned about, um, but we should be safe in here at least. Um, right. Questions, comments? <laughs> I did sort of talk about a break in history, but I didn't mean it literally. <laughs> Yeah, both.
Uh, thank you very much. Lovely stuff. Um, a, a shame almost you weren't here to hear Nils's talk yesterday, I think, because there seems to be a lot of, a lot of resonances. Um, I'm, I'm going to perhaps suggest three ways in which I think maybe society could become a work of art and, and hence utopian. Um, it's kind of my PhD, so please don't steal this, people. <laughs> um, but um, one is, is improvised music. Um, and, and when people mm -hmm. kind of collect together to, to collectively produce music um, mm. without a predetermined goal, um, which is art, but it's, I, th I think it's also political. I think it's kind of, um, it was a direct reaction, um, particularly the free jazz tradition to, to um, white racism. Um, the second is, is a novel that, that's very little known. Um, it's called um, The So-Called Utopia of the Centre Beauborg. Um, and no one seems to write about it. It's quite hard to get hold of. Um, but it's basically about uh, a, a, an artist who hollows out a space 80 stories deep underneath the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Um, and then has a public meeting and says, come and we can create a utopia. And thousands of people turn up and expect him to say, right, this is what we're going to do. And he just says, do what you like. <laughs> you know, this is your space. And he goes, oh, oh dear. Um, and the first people who make use of it are a group of motorcycle fanaticists. And they take over one of the stories and put um, moto equals culture on the wall. And gradually it develops a, a story where it's very sort of of its time, but mm. a story where schizophrenics um, paint some artwork on the floor, um, there's a library, lots of free love. Um, it's, 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 it's really interesting. Um, and the final one is perhaps a little bit more pl explicitly political and is, is the potential of creating um, sort of art in an education sense. Um, Felix Guattari um, spoke about making the classroom into a work of art. And I think this is something Nils was touching on yesterday. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure how uh, any answers on this, but kind of allowing the classroom space to be something where we'll perhaps the, the process of education is a work of art or the students and the teachers make art together. I don't know. But I don't know any thoughts on any of those. Well, that, that was sort of the purpose of the occupations. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of got overlooked now um, and being overtaken by all sorts of mm. awful practicalities like fees in our country and, and other things. But, but, but it's interesting that I think people were very taken by surprise by the size of the protest against the introduction of tripling of student fees in, in London few months ago. I mean, they, people knew there would be some protests, but it was massive, and it sort of woke up some of the trade unions to say, well, maybe we ought to do something one day as well. So that, that was interesting, but I think improvised music is a very interesting one indeed, because I'm not a musician, but I would imagine to do improvised music, you have to be very attentive. You have to be really there, and it's, you have to be very much in the present, in the moment. And maybe that's sort of what it's about. Um, what that makes me think around is um, well, things like single-issue campaigning, anti-roads protests, for example, in the 90s, which, were, again, was very big. Um, these things come and go, but and people have written about them in different ways. One way people have looked about them is to talk about the new kinds of coalitions that are made. Very different interest groups can come together on one issue. And yes, that, that, that's the case. I suspect that's actually not terribly important for the people who are there, however, for whom I think the moment of being there is in itself transformative. Actually, being there is the revolution in, in that sense. And if you look at um, anti roads protests, it's very, it, it makes its own culture, too. And the, the Twyford Down in the south of England was a particularly big protest against a new road. Um, where people called themselves the Dongas tribe, and they invented actually new words, a, a kind of coded language to warn each other of things happening and so on. Um, so it was practical but cultural uh, uh, as well. That was quite spontaneous. Um, it didn't have a plan, didn't have a program for first we'll do this, then we'll do that, then we'll set up this institution and so on. It was spontaneous reaction, and that's a difficulty because you either win or lose, and then it's over. Or maybe it isn't over, because actually maybe that moment is transformative. And that would be very much like what Lefebvre talks about in his theory of moments of liberation within the dulling routines of, of capitalism, which is a, a much earlier version of the theory that later becomes the, the theory of space. Um, and he writes about moments in the 50s and 60s. Um, actually, 40s and 50s and 60s. And it, it's... Um, it's very interesting that these sudden moments of clarity can occur anywhere, anytime, completely ephemeral, but it's never quite the same again afterwards. 
it's what I said at the beginning, it's that slight inflection of society. It's, it's another kind of long revolution. It's very gradual indeed, but it's also very widespread. So maybe that's interesting. And this happens all the time anyway, regardless of what any of us say now. Okay, I, I just want to pick up on the idea of the society as a work of art, and would there be any need of art in that kind of society? It's like asking, would there be art in Utopia? And obviously there wouldn't no. be any art in Utopia, because there would be no reason, I guess, to make art, which eventually leads to the question, but so do, do we need, do we need un, a, a state of unsatisfaction in order to produce art? Okay, to give about two answers there. First of all, just to get it out of the way, I don't personally believe in the, the pearl is made by the grit and the oyster theory that suffering is good for us, therefore we should all starve in some attic without, you know, I don't think enforced suffering makes good art. So I want to get rid of that straight away. There's enough already in the world. We don't need to invent it or put ourselves in peculiar positions to, to do that. However, um, when Boyce, for example, said everyone is an artist, he explicitly did not mean everyone is a professional fine arts professor like Boyce himself was. What I think he meant was everyone has a creative imagination and crucially, that imagination is political in that it can imagine new social formations just as much as new aesthetic formations. That seems to me quite an interesting and important idea. Um, but at the point where that could become any kind of reality, the specialist category of art would cease to have any relevance to it. I mean, categories only matter if they define particular define particular things, not general things. If everything is art, we don't need to call it art anymore. It's just there. It's only because art is, is a specialist thing, which has increasingly become part of the market and so on, commodity, that we use that term. So uh, the brief answer is no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the reasons for that go in a number of directions. And, and that isn't to say we shouldn't have artists now. To make that quite clear, I'm not an artist. I'm an in I'm a a writer, basically. I, I work in an ivory tower in an institution. I kind of like being in that position. But I'm not arguing against people making art, and I'm not arguing against interventionist art, because um, we're not in a society that is a work of art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're in the one we have, which is largely crap. Asmus? Thank you. Uh, clarifying question. When we talk about art and whether there will be still be a need for art if we establish this um, utopian society, what do we actually mean when we say art? Do we mean a specialized Western discourse about art and the art object and art criticism, or do we just mean this aesthetic object? Because lots of cultures, both pr uh, present and previous, have had to do with, uh, uh, and could, could exist without this specialized discourse about art. So is it the discourse we're talking about, or is it the aesthetic object in itself? Okay. First of all, we, this afternoon, sitting here, are not establishing a utopian society. We're, we're at a conference in an art gallery, and we're in a very specific set of terms because of that. Um, I think, how should I say, it, it's always going to be kind of contingent and negotiated, and it's always going to be kind of graded in various steps. So. At one end of the spectrum, you could say, well, art is anything that artists say is art, or anything an artist does is art. But that implies a certain process of validation already. And one of the difficulties with modernism is that anti-art also requires validation as art by art's own institutions, which largely in the West means an informal but very strong consensus between dealers, curators, critics, collectors, and some successful artists as to what constitutes the contemporary. So we have new museums of contemporary art springing up in every city across the world, more or less. And there's a very particular definition of what kind of art ought to get into those places and become visible by that route. If we were to simply talk about the art of today, of, or some phrase of that kind, that would include amateur art, people going to e evening classes in photography or embroidery, people who just sit at home drawing, um, people who have nice aesthetic thoughts, who knows? 
It would be enormously wide, and millions of people would be included in that, obviously. But that's largely invisible, other than to those who do it only in fairly small circles of individual contacts. I suppose what to me is interesting is that spectrum itself and the tensions that are created within it, rather than one end or the other end. So part of the, the work of thinking about that has to be to kind of say, how can we make that tension itself creative, rather than say, it's either this or that. And I'm not writing off the contemporary, of course. There's lots of really interesting work there. But I'm also not writing off the everyday, or what might simply be called culture in an anthropological sense, which I think is what you were beginning to hint at. And I suppose a simple answer would be in a society that was a work of art, there would be culture. But then, again, I have to say, but actually, if it's a society, it has culture already anyway. There isn't society without culture, because culture is simply the articulation of shared values and, and so on and so forth. So um, it's not really an answer to your question. I'm slightly rambling here, but in a sense, intentionally so, because I'm not in the answers department. Solutions are dangerous. We need to avoid them. It's really interesting uh, stuff you, you presented, um, but I, I would also like to, to ask to, to this metaphor of, of society as a work of art, um, um, do, doesn't it worry you that it was the same kind of metaphor the Nazis used, I mean, Hitler as a failed artist, um, <laughs> not being able to do you know, the actual artwork and therefore yes. uh, making society into his artwork and, 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 and sculpting the masses and so forth? Indeed, if only they had accepted Hitler into art school, we might not have had the Second World War. But actually, we might have anyway, because somebody else might have done the stuff. But it's, it depends which view of history you take. But um, OK, first of all, and actually, Stephen did a little bit of this this morning, I think. Um, there's a tendency to conflate the different um, false utopias or false millenarianisms, fascism, communism, are often seen together as repressive regimes. And yes, there were serious repressions, particularly under Stalin. It was very brutal indeed. I'm not making any pretense about that. But they don't actually have much else in common. Um, there are enormous differences between fascism and communism, or state socialism. And I, part of me, would, as a Western person who never lived under that system, must make that very clear, um, I do have a degree of nostalgia, I suppose, for the time when there were two ideologies available. And I don't like being in a world where there's only one. But of course, uh, well, maybe there are plural, maybe there are many. So I'm, I'm slightly cautious about this notion that Hitler too was a utopian. But it's not uncommon. If you look at the Faber Book of Utopias, published, uh, I think, in about 2000-ish, um, Hitler's prescription for the Ukraine as an organic farm to feed the greater Germany is included in that book. And it's a very common view amongst Oxford and Cambridge historians that utopia is either fascist or communist. It's not very nice, and it's European, and we shouldn't have too much to do with it. It's rather un-English. And I I, as a citizen of the European community, I don't subscribe to that horribly English, jingoistic view. Spilling water. Um, but I'm also not papering over, I hope, the, the, the problems there. Now I've forgotten what you said. Um, <laughs> Yes, sorry. Well, yes, okay, the aestheticization of politics. Um, yes, and the Nazis were very good at you know, the, the, the sublime, the architecture of searchlights is, is taken straight from post-enlightenment. And, and also putting beauty into politics. Also yes. Making beauty well, and not only that, but popular culture was far more important. And I mean, Bloch writes a lot about this. The, 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 the songs around the campfire, the... <laughs> reviving the old myths of lost crowns in the Rhine, uh, the Emperor Frederick under the mountain in the Hartz, uh, who was going to rise up and save Germany. And they, they reinvent all this rubbish. Um, it's, it's basically 19th century rubbish to do with German unification. But they bring all that back in the 1930s. And it's very popular in the petty bourgeoisie level. And they know that. They manipulate this in a very purposeful way. The left put forward dry, boring arguments, which don't persuade people enough. And that, that's a lesson of history. But I don't think Marcuse has in mind anything remotely to do with that when he says society is a work of art. I think 
what he means is, is much more the dream becoming reality. That as if, you know, what if moment, with a slight nuance saying, and by the way it could, by the way it might. And it is a dream. And hitherto, freedom has been displaced into aesthetics in order to contain it. You can be as free as you like in a novel. Just don't try and make it happen. Could that divide be collapsed? It's not actually that far away from Walter Benjamin's effort to collapse the divide between readers and writers in his essay, The Author as Producer, given to a, a, a meeting of anti-fascist writers in Paris in 1904, organized by the French Communist Party, in fact, or, and the Popular Front. So uh, I'm slightly wary of the question, because it's, it's a minefield, and it's one I don't particularly want to walk in, because I don't, I don't believe it ought to be a minefield. Um, because I would hold out that there were, in so-called actually existing socialism, some bits of socialism did actually exist. It's just they were not the whole thing. Talking to someone at Zeg in, in um, the, the Eco Village near Berlin, which is land in the old GDR, uh, land which used to be a Stasi spy training scheme, and in the 1930s was a Nazi youth camp. And they're taking over and greening the buildings and so on. But I was talking to someone there who said, they were mainly from the West, talking to local people, what they remembered before 1989 was the way in which people exchanged skills without money, a non-money economy. Because there wasn't a lot of money and there wasn't much to buy with it. But if I could bake bread and you could mend cars, I could give you bread and you could mend my car. And there was a lot of that exchange that went on informally. There was actually quite a strong invisible economy. And it's all finished. It's all over because now everyone charges. And people were nostalgic for that. So there were things that were okay, and we shouldn't forget that. There were things that were okay in international modernism, in, in planning and architecture. It was screwed up totally by functionalism and the idea that you could engineer a new society instead of handing over authorship of society for people to make it themselves. But that's the kind of thing we learn from history and why we hope it doesn't repeat in quite the same form. Thank you.